So it's like, mate, you are a disgrace in this language. And then it would be my turn, and I'm just as bad, if not worse. My teacher saying things like, if you're not rich, you may as well just give up already, or things like that. Your first thought is like, this person, you know, makes money out of this because this person is really good as well. These things just go in hand, and it's not always a case, you know. What, what's your goal with this piece? I want the audience to feel this. I want to help the audience. And I'm like, listen, if I wanted to help the audience, I would join the NHS. Like, Hello, Eduardo. Hello there. Nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you again, finally, in, per in well, virtual person. Yeah. Um, Hi. Let's start with the... Good to see you, man. Yeah, we've been interacting back and forth on Instagram, and we figured out that we you were born in 1994. Is it July or beginning of August? July. July yeah, yes. a couple of days apart. Aye, aye, yeah. I'm 24th. You're just around. Yes. Oh, oh, okay, okay. That's <laughs> a question, isn't it? Fair mm -hmm. enough. Difficult question. Aye. Uh, right, well. The connection's cutting off a wee bit. I hope I can hear you well. Yeah, it was just cutting off a bit there. Um, um, just let me know if you can't hear me well, okay? I will do. Well, sometimes the internet can be a bit messy, but fingers crossed. Uh, awesome. So you are from Gran Canaria. Indeed. And you are a photographer, a musician, Hi. but I've seen clips. Hi. Hi. Uh, what else do you do? Let's get those out the way. <laughs> So I so yeah I'm Spanish born and bred. Uh, I I I know I don't look very Spanish. I'm not your stereotypical Roberto from Valencia or something like that. Uh, but yeah, I am Spanish born and bred. Um, so back home I did violin in the conservatoire. Uh, I also did languages at uni, and yeah, I just like see like all my pals like started moving abroad to like what we call Europe. And I was just getting a bit bored of Gran Canaria, so I thought, right, I want to move out as well. I want to just be like my pals. Um, I got the opportunity to move out on my on my last year of uni, or doing Erasmus. In, in. So basically, I had so I wanted to go to like an English speaking destination. So I had basically Dublin and Glasgow, and I thought Dublin's a wee bit, I don't know, underwhelming. It's a bit too small, and I just thought. You know what? Like, you know, like they usually like, you Google like the destination. You have no clue about where you're going, and yeah. you like you Google Scotland, and you see like very basically like the, the fucking Glenfin and Viaduct and you know Glencoe and all this. And I'm like, this is absolutely beautiful. And then as soon as I moved to Scotland, I'm in fucking Springburn, living there for a year. So it was a bit of a contrast with the, with the photos I Google. Um, but I absolutely loved it, man. I was in Glasgow Uni uh, for a year. Um, yeah, it was great. It was great. Like that's where I met my pal uh, Mark because we 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 did Chinese together. We did Mandarin. Oh, and yeah. It was quite. Hi, it was quite a funny story actually because Mandarin is not like one of my main languages. But I thought, you know what, let's do it. Let's go for it. Um, it well, I only speak English and Spanish really. I did German, but I've forgotten pretty much everything. And Mandarin is just non-existent by this point. Like, right, yeah, you yeah, just have to use it. Like, yeah. yeah, it's also it's very right. like it's a completely different system. Like, it's as far as languages go, it's like just yeah, it's not even the same principles in certain aspects because obviously it's a tonal language. So yeah, it's yeah, yeah, it, it's a shock. And for me anyway, because Spanish is quite similar to English to some extent. I thought, you know, mantering is just a whole new level. But anyway, I like a challenge, so I went for it. And in the lecture room, right, so it, it was quite a small room, um, but basically about half of the class were Cantonese speakers and also people from Mongolia. So for them, mantering is, it was fairly easier. And then... Well, yeah, it, sh it should I, be. Because it's like... It should know, be. Culturally yeah. related. It's in the area, like... Yeah, especially pronunciation-wise, for Cantonese speakers, is is way easier than it would be for a Spanish person. There's no debate, and so I so it, it was quite funny because I was trying to I was trying really hard to make pals. You know, like for me, uni was not only about you know passing and all this. Uh, for me, it's also like it's a social experience. Is where you're meant to yeah. make pals, right? So you know, I was having that very 
a, a very open-minded approach, and I was just trying to talk with everyone. It just seems like in Glasgow, and everyone has a, a, an I don't have time for you kind of attitude, and I thought, this is a bit shit. I'd like to make friends, you know? <laughs> I'm in a new place. I want to make pal. So, anyway, yeah, of course. I had this... I, so we had these, like, um, reading passages in Mandarin, and so the, the Cantonese speakers were reading first, and it was it was clearly very easy for them. They just read it like no bother. And then, you know, the white trash sitting in the bag, just about to start reading the passage, you know, me and my friend Mark started reading, and we were so, so, so bad at it. We were really, really bad. And we were so, so disgustingly bad at it that we just had to become pals because we were constantly laughing at each other, like in tears, <laughs> and the way we were pronouncing it in Mandarin. So I was like, mate, you are a disgrace in this language. And then it would be my turn, and I'm just as bad, if not worse. So I was like, right, we need to be pals. <laughs> and I, ever since that oh, day, like, yeah. Glorious. I, that is yeah, Mandarin, man. Mandarin, Mandarin brings people together. Yeah, no, I mean, because you know. people don't think, I mean, being here, you don't think you, you hear the, you know, the foreigners accents and things like that. So people will hear my accent, your accent, whatever. But people don't think everybody has an accent in another language. I can only imagine how horrific we must sound in Mandarin. Like, so there's a thing called having an accent. And then there's me and Mark Black speaking Mandarin. <laughs> it's just a whole new level. It no, just goes beyond what an accent has, to be honest. I know, because, yeah, because what we do is basically, um, I, I do acting and sometimes I have to do play a character in a different accent, right? So normally if it's my like a Hungarian accent or a, or a Romanian accent, I approach it like, okay, so this person trying to speak English in Romanian, because you always relate it back mm -hmm. to what you already know. That's just how we operate. Yeah. Right? So yeah. you try to sort of for, recognize the sounds that you already know, and you sort of bring the language closer to you as opposed to necessarily going closer to the language. And that's how you end up with some hilarious sounds that in the actual language themselves don't make sense because that's not how it's built exactly. up. But exactly. it, it is funny to hear because like some yeah. of the sounds we come up with when trying to speak a language, it's like, what? <laughs> what the fuck? I know, I know, I know. Like, it's also the fact that the, the lessons were very fast paced because it started from scratch. Mm. But genuinely, like after a week or two, the topics were so complex for me anyway, that it was just very hard to keep up with. Got ni hao, and I'm probably butchering that as we speak because I don't know what to Same, to be <laughs> honest. <laughs> yeah. That's all I got. Okay, well, that, uh, that kind of narrows down, you know, how you end up in the UK. So you were like finishing uni, wanted to move out, experience the world and here you are but uh, let's rewind a little bit because i'm curious okay. how did you discover your passion was it for arts was it music specifically then photography like this is let's break that down a little bit sir okay yeah so i think i've always enjoyed the process of creating stuff in general mm -hmm. it might sound a bit soppy but just like you know kind of expressing myself through creating stuff and um, I think when I was in high school, like when I was about 12, literally as I started high school, I was just very underwhelmed with the whole, the dynamic of high school. It was just fucking boring. You go to this class, you memorize stuff. You might not even be interested about it. And I thought, no, I want something that I enjoy. That is like my thing. And in Spain, unlike maybe the UK or other places, if you want to study music, especially music, you will almost like it, you you will have to go to a conservatory because yeah music education in high school in spain is just rubbish really it's very very basic you literally have 30 pupils just playing playing the same flute that you know cost cost you a fucking euro and it sounds horrible so you really you if you want to to enjoy and you know learn about playing instruments and choose the instrument that you want to play you have to go to a conservatory so mm -hmm. I was very lucky that my grandparents and my parents really, uh, you know, enforced that idea in me. So I thought, okay, I'm going to go for it. And I chose the violin. I'm not even sure why, but I thought it was quite cool. The shape of it and the sounds, it, I thought, you know, this is quite cool. So yeah, I started playing that. I studied it for 10 years in the conservatoire. Acoustic um, or electric? Because I got to ask. Say again? Acoustic or electric? I got to split the room. Just the normal, yeah. It, it, it's a very, it's a very classical approach, uh, unfortunately, because it gets a bit boring after a while as well. 
you know, by Tobin all the fucking time. I'm like, I haven't signed different, you know. <laughs> uh, so it was good. It was good. It, it was good, especially like the social aspect of it again, because you meet like like minded people. So it was really good in that sense. Um, so yeah, like that I think really helped me uh, like as a teenager to to explore like different, you know, different areas, not just high school and then going home and, or maybe playing sports, which I didn't do as much back then. So it was really cool. It was a really enriching experience, if you like. And then I started playing orchestra as well. I think just halfway through the conservatoire education, uh, because it was constantly classical music, I thought I want to do something that is mine, not just play something that someone composed and then just doing the same as my other 15 uh, classmates, you know? So I thought, right, I'm gonna try to learn how to play music by myself and then it's my own rules. Because the, if there's something about the violin that is quite annoying, is that it's full of rules, absolutely full of rules. It's a very elitist environment as well. Um, so it's just full of like all these preconceptions about how you need to do it and, you know, where should you play and even what you should dress so i was like this is bullshit i want to do my own thing so i was yeah there is something about the arts i was having this chat with a photographer you know and uh, she grew up in milan and you know you recognize these sort of events and these groups are sort of quite cut off from the rest of the world and it's in a weird way like all the working artists are like struggling and trying to make ends meet but then somehow they become yeah. the entertainment for the elite and the upper class yeah. while the artists themselves are tend to be working class you know mm -hmm. yeah and then you, yeah. you you then i saw you become this weird person where you, you're working class background but upper class sensibilities you know and then it's like this we've all seen those people where you're like oh jesus yeah. christ yeah and it's, a, it's very palpable in the violin or any kind of classical music environment. It's just so full of these preconceptions. So uh, it was just so, so annoying, really. Like, especially in the orchestras, most of the people that I played with very, were very snobby. And I just didn't feel like that was my place. I still did it because it was very enjoyable, like on the music side of things, but I just wanted something to be my own. So. I was lucky I had a laptop, you know, is is it, honestly these days you can go really far with just a laptop and you know a pair of speakers or headphones, whatever. So I was really lucky I had one. Um being Spain, I, I downloaded a copy of you know Ableton and all these kind of music softwares. No um, comment from Romania. Very legally. Very no legally. Com no comment. Um so I started just playing about with it. Um I had some knowledge from the violin. And it took me ages, man. Like it seemed to like make just a, you know just a melody or a rhythm. It would take me like weeks and weeks and weeks. But you know, slowly I started just watching videos, tutorials like we've all done, and I started making my own music. And and for me, that was a, a very it was a, it was a very cathartic thing because it was my own way of just putting all my my own ideas somewhere and not just be constantly frustrated. Because as much as I enjoyed playing, it, it became very frustrating. So um, I think it also affected me, the fact that I had a private teacher. It was this like Bulgarian teacher and a stereotypical Bulgarian teacher that was raised in a Soviet environment. And literally she said to me, like her own mother locked her in her room as a child for like eight hours a day. And she would only be allowed out until, you know, until she played for eight hours. Genuinely, she she was absolutely affected by it big time, and I could tell. Yeah. I did <laughs> learn a lot of good things from her. Like I learned a lot about discipline, but yeah, she was she was just stereotypical toxic person. <laughs> no, the thing yeah. is, you need you need discipline, but you need the freedom to be you and create you. Like you you like. Once you need to, the freedom to figure out yourself and then you need the discipline to apply yourself, but they, they, you can't have only one. You need both. 100%, 100%. And she was so obsessed, you know, you need to play Bach like this. You need to play Beethoven like that. And I'm like, no, like I'm going to play however I want it. And I will have that discipline to do it, but I don't want to blindly follow your steps like that. And yeah, it did help for a while, but... Honestly, man, like, I think that was the tipping point for me because after that, I was just like, 
I've had enough. I've had enough. Honestly, like I, I'm, I'm absolutely fucking sick of the violin right now. What you and I need to do. You were a rebel in the classical violin world. <laughs> well, I was just very burnt out from it, really. And most people that I spoke with about this, they were feeling the exact same as me, but mm. they really, really wanted to pursue a career within this particular field. Mm. So, yeah, they were just like, yeah, it's just the way it is. You just need to put up with it. But honestly, the amount of like nonsense that I had to put up with, like my teacher saying things like, if you're not rich, you may as well just give up already or things like that. And I, I could see like, I know, I know it's mental, it's mental, but that's, that's classical violin for you. Really? Yeah. Is that like, I definitely... I'm not going to say this applies to everyone because I'm not in that world, but that's the kind of stuff you've heard as a teenager. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. That's classical uh-huh. violin for you. All right. <laughs> if you're not rich, give yeah, up. I know, it's, it's, I know, it's, it's bullshit, I know. And I wasn't rich anyway, so I was like, okay, whatever. Uh, but I kept going for a while, and it was just very a very frustrating experience in the end. So I thought, no, I'm going to start, like, I'm just going to concentrate on my own music, which I know it will be even more uncertain than maybe being in a conservatory or with, with a private teacher, but at least I'm being fed on myself because I'm, I, basically it reached a point where it was just putting me off music. And to me, that's like, it's the ultimate red flag. Like I cannot allow that to happen to me. So well, yeah, no, I just need yeah. to focus on, on my own thing. No, absolutely. That's when they create a sort of, I was, I did a vlog today specifically about this, about how sometimes you can create this sort of paradox in your mind, which is, I really want to do music, but then the only way they tell me I'm allowed to do music is this, which I hate. So now it's like this complete contrast and contradiction where you're like, yeah, you, it's it's not good for you mentally. No, you just, obviously, like, no, you no, no. Up, you can end up being depressed. Like I, I've, my first real depression as a teenager was I want to become an actor. I'm shit. That's the only thing I want to do well, but I'm shit at it. And I thought, oh, what? I'm lost. You know, I got nothing. And then yeah. that, that was my first depression as a teenager. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a very destructive approach. Like, I understand, again, like the discipline side of it. And yeah, you might need some studies. You might not. It's a very abstract thing. You cannot just measure it in one way only. And it mm-hmm. applies to any form of art, I think. Um, so yeah, yeah, man. Like, it, it was a lot of shit. <laughs> So it, yeah, it really I, just, I have this scene in my head of like Eduardo going, "No, I need to do my own music. Oh, throw the violin." Yeah, the teacher's pretty like, <laughs> "Pretty much, pretty much." Exactly. Enough, Teacher was like, "Do you know what? I'd be the press like me and and love and hate this at the same time." I'm like, "No, thank you." But no. I want to love it most of the time. Fair enough. Yeah. And. How did you mentally deal with it? I think that brings it up automatically. That that episode, that must have been a, a real mindfuck. It was. It was very eye opening. So I always try to focus on the positive, but it was. It was. It was quite a shocking um, time because it lasted. I don't know, two or three years at least. Mm. And at the time, I didn't have the mentality or the, you know, the, yeah, I, I I didn't understand it fully. I was just like. I was very confronted with myself because I thought, like, the bigger part of me was like, no, no, I just need to do it because that's what it is, really. But then, yeah, there was another, like, growing part of me saying, no, this is not right. And you need to stand for yourself and all this. And, yeah, it was it was, it was was an intense period, to be honest. Um, I was really anxious all the time. I couldn't sleep the days before going to these classes. I had to take, like... Um, just like these like herbal kind of things to like make you relax and all that stuff. So I just thought this is bullshit, man. How can how can I make a career of this fucking nonsense? Like this is killing me inside. This is not right. Surely this is not the way music should be. So it was I was lucky as well because I had several pals in similar situations and we could relate. So that was massive, I think. Yeah, having yeah the it- it takes a lot of strength to be the only one that says it. So it can be helpful to have other people that are like, yeah, this is not right. Absolutely. Ideally, ideally, like the goal is to be able to say something by yourself and be like, this is what I believe in. This is how I see it. And unless you bring me something better, you know, I'm not going to change my mind. 
But that takes yeah. a lot of, that again takes a lot of discipline of just being okay with yourself yeah. alone. Especially because Gran Canaria, the Canary Islands, is a very isolated place. It's like literally next to Africa, right? It's very far from continental Europe and it's very far from everything that's going on in continental Europe. So mm. it's in my opinion, I think it's even harder to 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 go off the main path, so to speak, there, because options are very limited. Even just for these actual careers, options are extremely limited. So let alone if you want to be different and do your own thing. So we all have that mindset of we're going to try to be someone in, in violin, in my case, so that we can move to Europe and then find something different if we like it. But for now, we kind of need to stick to this. So, yeah, th there's it's, there's a, a massive sense of, like, you're less than the rest in the Canary Islands just because of how far apart we are yeah. and how 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 much fewer options we have there and as opposed I'm, to other I'm places. Just guessing, I'm just guessing um, when it comes to paperwork, obviously you, it belongs to Spain, right? Uh, yeah. So you would get the passport and stuff. So just traveling, it would be easier to Europe than traveling, for instance, to Africa, even if you're closer to Africa, but politically and all the paperwork and stuff and visas, yeah. it's not, especially if you're not rich, it's not a viable thing to do. So you're going to immediately navigate towards where you think you're going to have it easier. Yeah, and more definitely, possibly. definitely. Like, even though like us Canadians have like a discount to travel to the mainland and all that, kind of the same setup as here in Scotland in the islands, even though we have that, when you're like 15 years old, you know, Spanish economy is not great and people at that age don't have a job and you're scared, basically. So you can't afford to like go, you know, travel to Germany, Switzerland, and Austria where the main violin, you know, movement is happening, which is expensive places, right? And then you pay for accommodation and then these master classes could easily cost you 10 grand for a week. So how the fuck are you going to afford that when you're from the Canary Islands or anywhere really? Like, it's just too expensive. So the, the options are very limited. I only had like a handful of pals I could afford that because they were quite rich. So it's the only way to afford it, really. I mean, yeah, in this case, I'm curious. Uh, how does a violin player, you know, try to make a living? Like, other than being in a, an orchestra, like... So most people end up, like, even if, if that's not what they really wanted, most people end up doing things like teaching violin, say, in the conservatoire or, in, like, in, in private schools or just private tuition. That's yeah. what most people end up doing because it's the most accessible way because it doesn't really require all these, like, very expensive, like, master classes and all this, all this kind of stuff. So, yeah, yeah it's, honestly, it's all about money. It's a very elitist instrument like it or not yeah. unfortunately fair enough that's a, that's an interesting thing uh, i just <laughs> i was not aware of the violin like with guitar you know you can't have a guitar night at a bar someone will come and play guitar and they'll you know you don't see a lot of violinist buskers is what i'm trying the point i'm trying to make right i mean i haven't seen it's it not as common no i mean they definitely might not as common violinist. yeah all right you I, i've seen that in european cities quite a lot but yeah, it might be definitely not in the UK, to be honest. It's, it's not that present here, I don't think. And yeah, like, yeah, most people end up just moving to to either, you know, electric guitar, electric bass, kind of stuff like that. Not out of choice always, but maybe because there, there are more options. It's, it's, there's this more, yeah, there's, there's more options. You can, you know, you can have a band, you can make music for any kind of media, you know, things like that. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's fun to be an artist. Yeah, it's it's an interesting aspect to consider is the era that you're in. You know, I mean, I wouldn't say that the violence going downwards, but obviously it's classical music. It's not contemporary. So there's like a weird, not a weird vibe, but it has, uh, it comes with a perception of certain baggage. And it's like coming up now, we have the electric stuff more yes. some of the classical still holding on and every now and again someone comes out with like an old school you know viking chant track and that kicks off but yeah it's an interesting thing to consider of like the how society evolves markets evolve and the musical world so it moves yeah. to a new instrument and you're like trying to keep up 
or learn or hundred percent. And to this day, you 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 still get people that are trying to do something different with the violin. Mm. Um, you also get people that you know use the the violin in in, in jazz music as well. But as it stands, it's still a bit of a niche. It's mm. not very extended, so it's still very restricted to you know small circles. Like no, when you think of a violin, you you, you don't really hear a violin and in most scenarios perhaps in scotland it's a bit different because we have the fiddle tradition as well yeah. um but yeah. at the end of the day that is still traditional music is, is classical scottish music at the end of the day so yeah I, the, the violin is still struggling to find its place in modern music i would say there is someone i think managed to sort of break into the well i don't know mainstream but definitely youtube I think, was it lindsay sterling yeah it rings a bell yeah She's the yeah, one that was playing all these years ago. Some of her own tracks, some modern stuff, and then but then she's also like doing acrobatics almost, like she's dancing. <laughs> on the I know, I know. Like she's right. ice skating. But imagine like violin. imagine you speak to a fourteen year old and you're like, right, you need to learn the violin, play eight hours a day, and you need to learn how to jump off a fucking bridge and not die, so that you can be someone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, jump through a ring of fire while you play, you know, Vivaldi. <laughs> yeah, no, because I was thinking like she's someone that had just occurred to me that she's been sort of creating her own stuff and playing some modern tracks. So that's like okay, so the violin is still very much like you know in the fight. It's not out yet, but you, it has to be reinvented almost. I, I think one of the reasons why she's managed to 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 create her own name, so to speak. It's because she does so much more around the violin. You know, she is basically doing inter like proper entertainment in every aspect of the world. It's yeah, not just yeah. the 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 sound, you know, is is visual, it's it's a full experience. And yeah. that's why I think she's she's made it. Um but if you only play and you don't do other forms of performance, you know. Uh, I still think it's a wee bit hard at the moment. Yeah, I mean, there's an idea for you. Just go the opposite way. Grumpy Spanish violin player and just stand there and look at the crowd and just... Is this what you want? It could work. It could work. <laughs> you never know. Yeah, you yeah. never Content. Try it. <laughs> okay. And then did you all... When... How did the switch to photography happen? I'm curious about that now, sir. So, yeah, so that was more of a lockdown thing, to be honest. I started taking photos like two years ago. What's um, up? Bloody yeah, Because you went from yeah. zero to 100 in three years, my friend. <laughs> um, Basically, like, I, I was just, you know, plastic situation that most of us went through. I was just bored in the house, and I was lucky enough that I kept my job but also I had the opportunity to to work overtime. So I just thought, you know what, fuck it, I'm just going to work because literally there's absolutely nothing else to do. And it was keeping me sane. And I just I just really wanted a camera at that time. I was like, yeah, I, just, I, I would really enjoy taking photos and stuff like that. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to work all the time. I'm going to work through lockdown and I'm going to buy a camera and I'm going to start taking photos. And it also happens that I'm quite outdoorsy. Um, I I like going on hikes and stuff like that. I, um, yeah. So I just combine that together. I put it together, and then people seem to enjoy the photos. So it was quite good. I mean, I, I think they're quite distinctive visually. I like think it's you, right? Like that's. I think so. It, it is not. It is funny because like it, this just pisses me off a little bit because it goes back to what you've been saying about <laughs> the violin. You know, it's okay. the biggest artists we talk about. It's like, oh, it's them. It's they have their own clear voice, their own clear vision, right? But then the, the entire time the school's like, no, but you have to do it like this. You have to do it like this. But like, can we talk about the vision and the clarity of you know the personality behind the instrument as well, please? Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, I think. Yeah, it, it, on speaking on, on the photography side of things, like I think it all comes down to insecurity, which I've, I'm the first one who's had it, because mm -hmm. especially because Instagram these days is a main tool, really, like it or not, it's the main tool at the moment for okay. photography. Photography. Um, yeah. I think the the insecure side of me back in the day thought, you know what, if I want to make it again or like if I want some exposure I need to give people what they want and I, I had that insecurity 
uh, insecurity in my mind all the time. Like people want this, people want the same fucking photo of Glencoe and Sky and Loch Lomond, and it's the only way, you know, to make it or whatever. I'm yeah. talking about, you know, Scotland, right? Scottish photography. And I thought, like, like, yeah, obviously these places are quite mainstream and accessible to the eye for a reason, right? They're beautiful, they're absolutely stunning. And I thought, yeah, that's quite good. Like, I, I wanna, I wanna showcase that. I wanna, I wanna show people the way I can portray that. But, um, you know, the the moment you start following photographers, you realize that we all make the same mistake of just sticking to the same content on and on and on out of fear of being different. Because the moment you're a wee bit different, you may not get the same exposure. It's it's risky, you know. Is is the moment you you start posting photos of something different you are basically taking a risk because people might not like it and then people will just forget about you. And especially with Instagram, you know, we sometimes we we tend to be a bit obsessed with all the numbers and the followers and all this. So yeah. I uh, I know pretty much every photographer will agree with me in the sense that we've all at some point of our lives or maybe now we've paid far too much attention to the likes and the followers and all this or the the, the real views as well. And we use that as a metric to our value as a photographer. And it's yeah, as an actor, I can relate. As someone who creates stuff on YouTube, I'm like, yeah, every now and again, it's like, let me see the numbers. And, and obviously, you- we all do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, the like, no, we, we, we've all seen Blanco by now. Like, I think people deserve, Scotland deserves to, to, to be shown. Uh, in many different ways like there's so much more to scotland than that and even though that is absolutely stunning i think uh, you know for me because my niche again is scottish photography especially mountain photography i think is very important to just show people you know everything else that's that's literally here where we live yeah at least us in scotland i mean Mm -hmm. i think any place is uh any place is beautiful in its own way. And you can say some places have, have beauty that appeals to more people than others, or, you know, there's, there's something's more of a niche, but nothing is fundamentally just through, like, through and yeah. through. Ugly. There's beauty in every place. Exactly. So if, if you're like, if you're not going to use the place where you're at, if you're not going to start there and not going to explore it, and then like, what you literally wasting resources and time and not, well, not wasting time, but, you know what I mean? Like you're, you're, especially in the beginning, you got to yeah, start with what you, know, what you have around you. 100%. So, and we've all done it. We've all done it. I'm the first one who's done it. We always want to start with things that are accessible and it's quite easy to photograph because you're just learning at first. You just, yeah. you know, when I got the camera, like, I didn't know even how to charge it. You know what I mean? I was like, what the fuck's this? Honestly, like I got a, a manual lens, I remember. Um... And I was like, how do, you, how, how do you focus here? I was like, what the fuck is this? Um, but, you know, trial and error is, is, the, is the way forward, really. And yeah. hang on, so you started, yeah. you said lockdown. So that's actually t- 2020, not even three years, two years ago, technically. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you've been taken off, my friend. I mean, I've seen your, your work. I've been following your yeah. work. I, I do love it. I think Thank it's you. beautiful. Uh, and that kind of actually it brings up the question just sort of popped into my head, which is how has photography changed the way you see the world? Has it changed? Because if, if you already had the, the passion for photography, chances are you've already you were sort of visually inclined before it. So you might not it might not okay. be a massive change, but they might have seen like gradual changes. You're more, you know, things pop out more than they used to. Or... Yeah. So personally, I have really bad memory really bad like honestly i think it's a it's an attention span thing actually and at the same time i'm a very melancholic person if you like probably comes from the violin and um, for me photography is the way to you know kind of relive that memory so because my memory is quite bad i can play that you know to my advantage because i can basically shape the way i remember the place so i think whenever i'm somewhere you know, on a trip or, you know, going up a mountain or whatever, the way I took, I take the photo will fundamentally shape that memory later on, you know, in yeah. 10 yeah. years, a year, doesn't matter when. 
and I think for me that's why it's very important to take a photo that I'm 100 satisfied with and I am also like too perfectionist like sometimes it's just far too much and it just plays against me but honestly I cannot change it it's part of my personality I think mm. but yeah again I try to use that to my advantage so I think you know see this mountain and this tree here I'm going to try frame it and make a composition that it really you know strikes me and I'm like wow I think once I forget about this day not forget slowly but you know I just I have a very vague memory of it when I look back at this photo I'm going to be like oh this was fucking class and I love this day it was such a good day I enjoyed myself so much and I think the way the photo's taken really shapes that memory because at the end of the day, that's what the photo's for, it's a memory. Yeah, we, I was actually thinking about this because obviously I knew we were going to have this conversation today. I was like, what's fascinating about photography is that it's it's a prompt. It's like you literally yeah. screenshot. It's not, it's not about the picture necessarily. It's about the picture partially. But it's the prompt that it brings up, you know, all the things exactly. that were tied to that image. And you're like, oh, I'm just in this little time capsule for a second where all these things are coming back, you know, like, oh, yeah. I was there and it felt like this and we were having this. And then my friend said something stupid, but whatever, you know, like. Exactly. Exactly. And it's just a way of, you know, just reliving that memory again and having a more vivid uh, memory of it, really. Yeah. So it, it's the way I do it because maybe because my memory is bad, but it works for me because I, I feel like of all my memories the visual and the maybe the the musical one are the better ones so as soon as i see a photo i just remember everything like the things i was talking about maybe the song i was listening to things like that so it really helps me so i always did that for myself i always have the mindset of you know in 10 years when i look back um, I want to, you know, remember all these days because they were class. And I started sharing that on Instagram mainly, and people were enjoying it, and people were asking me for, you know, maybe indications as to, you know, how to get to this mountain or whatever. Just kind of share the experience a bit more, but mainly do it through the photos. So I thought, you know what? Okay, I'll do it. You know, if people enjoy it, then why not? But I didn't have any agenda, to be honest. I was just sharing them. And yeah, again, because the main thing that I have done in the last year and a half is hikes, especially mountain hikes. I think that like inevitably built a niche of hikers. Well, um, yeah, you've been, you've been Mon Monroe bagging, as they say. A wee bit, a wee bit, How yeah. many Monroes yeah. are you on now? Uh, 155, I think. Yeah, 155, yeah. 155 more rows out of uh, two years mainly yeah yeah but not how many uh how, what's the total oh, sorry 282 okay sir you are more yeah, than this a lot of them you're more than this a lot of them but <laughs> yeah it is a lot but yeah now that's uh <laughs> that's actually a nice memory for me. ages, man. <laughs> i believe basically uh growing up my dad he loves mountains he actually prefers mountains to seas i happen to love them both but uh he once every summer especially during high school years we take a week off camping just go up one of the mountains in romania and that was like us five days roaming about amazing amazing it's romania is just stunning like i i was there for like four days okay. so i'm obviously not an expert because romania is a massive country but it's, it's just stunning i went to transylvania and just the mountains and distance is just it's stunning it's stunning that's yeah, I, I reckon, especially during autumn, if you go, um, there's this region, uh, as you pass, it's a straight through the Mount Carpathian Mountains, and it's just okay. like something out of a classic gothic, you know, vampire novel. It's just dark, orange, red, some, you know, the trees are looking a bit blackish now because of the rain and everything's a bit muddy, and it's just this, you, you're you expecting witches everywhere. It's beautiful. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's honestly a stunning, like, Again, it was a very short trip for me, so I didn't get to discover like, like discover it properly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, obviously I went to the, the castle, right, the castle, and it's just stunning. It really is. It's a shame because it was like a really sunny day, so I didn't really like. I get, get that. Like, in a vampire vibe, you know. Um, <laughs> well, you know. But 
Oh, it was stunning, man. It was in, in I think. Hang on. Back again. So, yes. So, Transylvania. Yeah. Trans- Castle. Loved it there, man. Like the weather was really, really nice. To be fair, it was very sunny. It was really cold as well. Proper, you know, winter time. But it was amazing. Really, really enjoyed my time there. Again, I think I only went for like three, four days, but it did give me an idea of what Romania is like. In oh man, I mean, people. As well. I, I recommend it to everyone because it's cheap. The food is phenomenal, and yes, it is. If, if there's a bit of everything. But if you want to go, like. I, you just brought up all these memories I have of like going to different caves and stuff. And I remember one year we went to uh, an ice cave, right? And there was another cave, which is called uh, Bear Cave. Supposedly, basically, yeah. this bit in the mountain like collapsed and all these bears got trapped in there and started eating, eating each other and whatnot. But if you go in, it's like these um, rock formations like stalagmites and stalagmites, you know, from the ceiling and from below. And it is, oh my God. Like, if you want to see like yeah. an otherworldly experience fairly affordably, yeah. Romania is your place to go. Also, like, I feel like quite a lot of people speak Spanish or at least understand it there. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. They have good understanding. And I, I used to work with a Romanian girl, and she told me that the way she learned it was because she was obsessed with like Mexican telenovelas. And oh, I thought I mean, that was so uh, funny. Yeah, Romania like, is. The way she learned it. Right. Yeah, no, Romania is an interesting place because uh, obviously it's Eastern Europe, but somebody told me this, that, like Romanian people are the Latin people of Eastern Europe. That's, a, that's a, one of my friends told me, like, we do have like our TV channel gets, you know, like Spanish and mm-hmm. Mexican and South American telenovelas. Like it was Prima TV, well. which was like mostly telenovelas, right? Well. And then our music, you know, we, we regularly listen to reggaeton and things like that. So yeah, there's it's an interesting oh, sort of intro there like without that's cool that's cool yeah um, yeah yeah so, so yeah the, the language is laughing obviously so for me well it's, it's very difficult for me to to read it to be honest but you can yeah. read like signs and stuff like that and you're like oh that rings a bell you know it's, it's remotely close this it is it is yeah. uh, there's like always this. I, i'm not fluent in spanish but the, i've been to spain once and like certain things i'm like oh, okay like it translates. I'll figure yeah. it out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Loved it. Loved it. Good. I mean, go back. <laughs> oh, I would love to, especially now with the camera. I think I would appreciate it much more. Because back then I was just, you know, very just basic tourism. You know, like, oh, that's nice. Anyway, let's move on. Okay, nothing. And I think now I'd be able to, I'd, I'd have, I would appreciate it more. I think I would enjoy it more. Definitely. Uh, I am curious, I just wanted to ask you this, but like, which do you pr- focus on more at the moment? Is it photography or the music? Which one? I think because I've received more attention on the photo, on the photo side of what I do, I've inevitably put more effort into it. It's yeah. probably an ego thing, really, just because I get more attention there, you know, I get that ego boost, so to speak. People are like talking to me about it or messaging me, oh, that's nice. Whereas with my music, I feel like my music being quite experimental and not quite easy to listen to, is much harder to to get people to, to listen to it. Hmm. Um, with that said, I feel like also photography is more of an, it's more introverted really. Right, with a photo, you're not really interacting with the people face to face. Whereas with music, you need to get yourself out there, perform, and it's a very, it's a very uh, extrovert thing to do, really. Yeah, so there's my flat me there. Um, so it's a, it's a bit different, right? Um, and I feel like at the moment, I'm I'm more in like an introvert time of my life, really. Um, yeah. I like I, I don't have any issue like socializing or anything like that. But sometimes I just go into like I just, yeah, like almost like winter kind of time. I just like go into my own and and photos are great for that because you don't need to deal with anyone face to face. And that is fucking class sometimes, to be honest. <laughs> uh, like when I've had to do like a job like or something like that, yeah, obviously you, you deal with people face to face, but um, in general, photo is just a much more reserved thing, you know? 
And yeah. like, I, I, might, I might share it with you, but you can do it on your own perfectly and it's fine. And it's, it's just that my personality at the moment is much more introverted right now. So, so yeah, music demands a, a much different approach. That's fair. All right. Yeah. Okay. And what I was going to ask you on the photography side, but I'm guessing you can answer that on the music side as well, is what does a project look like? Is there an idea? Is there, I'm guessing photography can be, I mean, the way I do it, because I'm, you know, I've got a little lens and a little phone. It's like, it's very much, you know, run and gun, you know, like, oh, I'll see a thing. Oh, this actually is pretty cool. I'll take a picture of it. Every now and again, it's a lot rarer now. I'll go out and go on a photo session. Yeah. But yeah. it's more run and gun. Um, but I'm guessing music is a bit more you sit down and you think about it and you plan it out a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask so, you, is there a difference as well, the parallels between the two mediums and how you approach a project? Let me put it simply like that. So the way both things are created is, is very, it's a very lonely process and it's just me for myself. And I love that. I love spending time on my own is, is something that I've always enjoyed. So both music making and taking photos is mm -hmm. something that you can fully do on your own. Now, you know, performing it or showing to the rest is what can be a bit different, you know, like performing music or showing photos. But um, so the similarity is that it's something that I can do alone and it's my thing. And the difference, the difference perhaps yeah. It's, it's so so hard to explain that. I, I think the difference between making music and taking photos is that perhaps I, I, I feel like taking photos g gives me a more immediate satisfaction. It's a short term satisfaction and perhaps it can be less intense, whereas music, it just inevitably requires much more time and effort. It's more of a long term thing, like maybe you make an album or something like that. It's gonna take you time. It's, it's not. It's not gonna take the same time as taking a photo and then post processing it. So, I think it is. It's, it's all about how lazy I'm feeling, really. Like, see if I feel like I cannot be asked. I'm like, I'll just take photos and I'll do. In the sense that it's more of an immediate process. Mm. And if I feel motivated enough and I can be asked, then I'll be like, okay, I'm gonna sit down and make music. The problem is that once I sit down and I start making a song, um, I might spend six hours on the laptop and I might go absolutely nowhere. And then I'm like, this is rubbish. And I'm just deleting the file like for this. So I, I need to have the predisposition to, to be willing to waste that time. And it's not something that I always feel like doing. Mm -hmm. Now I can mm -hmm. relate to that. But yeah, I, this is like, one of the things yeah. I'm facing right now. I was actually, today I was vlogging about this, is that sometimes, because we want to do things well from the get-go, or like, growing up I had this, you know, if you're going to do something, do it right. Yeah? So it's like, you, you want to be creating something beautiful from the beginning, but realistically speaking, mm -hmm. there's a really good chance that you're going to sit down and going to have a microscopic kernel of an idea, you know, like not a tenth of an idea and then you fuck around with it and then you come up with 10 bad ones but then after the 10 bad ones because you know okay i'm not gonna go in that direction you turn in this way you come up with like an okay one and then you keep going and you come up with another okay one next thing you know you go back and you're like oh actually i can make this into a great one but you have to like 100%. go through that process of gardening 100 yeah like for me, music, the music making process is a bit of a, of a collage as well, like you're saying, because it all comes down to my bad memory, I feel like, because I might have an idea in my mind and I might try to work on it as much as I can. But then after one session of, you know, making music and putting the ideas together, I might just leave it there and forget about it for a week or two. Mm. And then by the time I'm back to that, the idea is just gone or it's just it's just transmutated so much that it's different now. So this is usually the way I make it. And this is probably when, this is probably why, like, if someone was to to listen to a song that I make, I'm like, what the fuck? This is like, it's, 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 it's fucked up because it's like so many different things, like, so, like, you know, just put together there. Like, so yeah, I think everything that I make is heavily 
affected by, yeah, you call it low attention, like short attention span or bad memory, but mm. but yeah, uh, usually that's, that's the way it is with music. I, I put lots of things together, I come back to it, I leave it there, I just neglect it for a while, come back, back and forth, and then at the end, I'll try to put it all together and try to make sense of it. Um, I mean, so I would... it's very different to photos. Okay, I was gonna ask, based on what you've been telling, would you say that you put more of yourself into your music than your photography? I force myself to do both, to be honest. Whether I, I can be bothered or not, I do force myself to do both. Ah. Again, like, like if I'm feeling lazy, then I'll go for the immediate kind of reward, which is the photography. And if I feel like I am willing to put all that time, then I will go for music. But I'm trying to to impose a balance. No, no, what, what I meant specifically was like when you look at the pictures you've taken or when you listen to a song you've created, would you say that one of them like, packs more of your soul, like expresses more of you personally? No, I put the same into everything that I make. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, that's Whether good. I achieve it or not, then that's a different yeah, but... topic. But I, I will, yeah, yeah, always, 100%. The most important thing is, you, you know, the intention that you try your best, first and foremost. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it, if, if I feel like that's not there, then, I, you know, I'll delete it. I don't want that. You know, I want that to, because that's the point. You need to express something and you need to, you know, try express yourself. So okay. if I feel like I've managed to do it, then it's because I really tried at least to, to do my best. So that's the same for music, photos or, okay. or cooking even though I'm a horrible chef. Oh, we got to... Mm. No way. <laughs> we could, but right. there's Give nothing to talk about because I'm horrible at it. <laughs> All right, okay. Um, interesting. I'm, I'm learning. I'm, I love learning about people, you know, how they think about their art and their business side of their art, and there's a lot you can go into. You can talk about this for hours. Um, I mean, I was just thinking, like, for a beginning photographer, you know, what, what is the level of investment we're talking, talking financially? Like what, uh, how much did you invest before you got to the stage where you said, okay, I'm a, I can call myself a professional. Now. I have the necessary skills and the equipment to be a professional. So my, maybe it's a problem, maybe it's not, but I'm a very black or white person. So I either, you know, hundred percent or absolutely nothing. So I thought, well, let's go hundred percent classic and i thought i if i want a camera i want to to work towards getting the best one right so that was my mindset you know it's a very toxic mindset sometimes but it can work out well sometimes as well so i thought you know what if i have the opportunity to work and save that money for what is a camera i want to get the best one so um i think i invested like four grand basically four grand. Um, because i was just working like 72 hours a week like literally HR messaged me like, you need to stop this shit because we're going to get in trouble because of you. <laughs> so I was like, okay. But I was like, no, but I need to save for a camera, you know. Um, so I went for that. I was like, you know, all or nothing kind of attitude. Um, a bit risky because maybe, you know, it could have turned out that I didn't like it, but I thought I was just going to go for it. Um, so yeah, I, I and then time-wise, I just invested myself like, Really, because I was really, really engrossed in it. Like I was just enjoying myself so much. It was just an, such an enjoyable process. Like just taking the photos and and you know working on them after. And I, I tried to do some video as well, which I don't enjoy that much. But it was just such an enjoyable process. Just a just like a different way of doing the same that I've always done. Like just like expressing myself, so to speak. Yeah. Um. So I genuinely put all my time and effort into photos outside my working hours. Um, and yeah, I, I, I literally just integrated the camera into my life, really. So I would go on a walk, I would take the camera. I would go on a hike, I would take the camera. Um, and yeah, it, it just became so, so enjoyable that it, it was just, you know, I, I could not go out without the camera and that was, I enjoy the process like massively. To be All right. I, I was just curious because, yeah. like, whenever people are starting out, you know, I've been dabbling away and you know having fun. But yeah, it's uh, 
there's always that interesting sort of ceiling of like one day I'll get to call myself a professional. And uh, most of the, I think a lot of people, I don't know if most of the time, but a lot of people, you know, they tend to err on the side of caution. I'm not a professional. Yeah, you know, I'm not this. I'm not that. I don't dare to call myself that, right? Yeah. Uh, and that happens o- often, right? But every now and again, you can rush into it and then call yourself that oh, I'm, I'm this already. So I'm just curious of what's, what, what, how, how you felt, you know, what's the ceiling that you want to touch or when you can say like, okay, I've got the skills, I've got the camera, let's go. I just went straight to it and I was just talking shit all the time, but I was just like, no, no, I am a professional. You know, I don't even know how to charge the fucking camera yet, but I am a professional. So it was very risky, very, very risky, but I would, I was trying to sell myself like one. So I was just like, yeah, no, I, I work with photos even though on my first day, I had never done a job with photos. So I was just like, no, I, I do it, I do it. And just wing it really, you know, classic. You, just, you it winged you it, it. Like you just went, yeah, I was gonna say, just faked it till you made it. So, yeah, because I, I think, I think we like, you're gonna be your worst enemy if you tell yourself like, oh, I'm amateur and all that, you know, no, just, just value yourself as much as you can. It's not even about lying or not lying. It's beyond that. It's just value your work and don't worry about whether you are making money out of it or not because this is just creative jobs. They're always going to be uncertain. So just do it, wing it, and then that's the way everyone does it. You mm. know what I mean? Just go into a course to learn how to, you know, how to like do that and all this. It's not going to make you or better or worse. It's going to give you a different approach, but it's not better or worse. And not because you spend money to do that, you are now a professional. It's not about that. Like, I think the term professional is just much more related to to the money you make out of it than the value of your work. Because there's a lot of people out there that are technically professionals because they make money out of it. And perhaps the quality of their work is not even that good. So... Yeah, they work professional. Like, what does it even mean? You know, so I mean, that's that's a fairly good uh, point there. That some people mean professional as in v- very good quality, and some people mm-hmm. mean professional as in it gets money. And that's not always the profession, exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, hundred okay. percent. And and obviously, yeah, that happens all the time in photography. Like, you hear the term professional photographer, and you your first thought is like this person you know makes money out of this because this person is really good as well these things just go in hand and it's not always the case you know i mean there's a lot of people out there that might not have the same quality and make money and vice versa so yeah i think uh i'm I'm learning that it's uh in most cases it's about your marketing as much as it is about your skills and sometimes one can make up for the other you know 100 percent but I, ideally, the best is when you got both going at a high level. Obviously, that is that is the that's what we all aim for. Yeah, yeah, hundred um, percent. And with social media, there's also like, you know, the, the social currency within our work. You know, the likes, the the followers, the views, all that kind of stuff. Because mm-hmm. we can't we can't help but use that as a metric to come to to judge ourselves. And we all do that, like, in, instinctively, almost like we just go to someone's account and think, oh, my God, like, 200,000 followers, this person is going to be fucking class. And maybe their work is shit, you know, like, it doesn't have anything to do with the numbers. Or it might not even be oh. shit, but it's just not my niche at all. I mean, exactly, something or just... Yeah, with, with art, it's interesting. With anything, it's interesting because you can have... There's the objective part of it of, like, is the camera clear? Is it fuzzy? You know, can you see the image? Yeah. Of it? And then there's yeah. a subjective part of it while they're trying to communicate and how well they're communicating, you know, that message. And it can 100%. be a problem. Sometimes the fuzzy camera is the point of the picture. You're not supposed to see the clear picture. You know, like it's... It's very subjective. Like, this is why, yeah, there's obviously like the minimum like we can all agree with because it's almost like the technicality of the instrument has to turn it on or how to focus or things like that. Um, But then, yeah, the possibilities are endless. 
and I think that's what makes photography so cool. Mm. Same with music. All righty. I mean, and so normally, because I'm I'm experimenting myself with these interviews, so normally it was very much about people's stories. I'm kind of bringing in the sort of technical aspects of it and trying to merge the two. So I was curious, how have you been finding the music scene and the photography scene in Scotland? Obviously, being from uh, Gran Canaria, has that played a part? Has it come up? Okay, so uh, the music side of me within Scotland has been very, very limited because of myself, because I've not felt like the, like, I, I've not felt open enough or extroverted enough to, to go out there and play. So I've played a few times here life, and then I was just like, no, this is, I'm not enjoying this. I need to go back to my cave and just, you know, not be exposed to people kind of thing so i always find a lot of refuge in the photo so in scotland i have perhaps because i got my camera here and here is where i kind of like took it more seriously and invested more time in it here is where i've had more uh, attention so to speak more than in the canaries because i didn't have the instruments back there and back then um so it's been great, man. Like Scotland's been really good at giving me opportunities to, to, like just to to get to know people, to to find jobs. Um, it's also like my kind of like it, it's kind is the kind of photography that I enjoy as well because my my niche is probably landscapes is what I enjoy the most. Okay. So Scotland is great for that. Great, great, lots of landscapes. Compared to the Canaries as well, we don't really have seasons in the Canaries, so it's very limiting when it comes to landscape photography. And and yeah, Scotland has provided the opposite. You're rediscovering a whole like the same landscape in a different seasons, a whole different ball game. Hundred percent, man. Like I saw the snow like for the first time eight years ago, and I'm 28. So yeah, like yeah. So uh, Scotland's been great for that. It's, it's been eye opening and. Not only that, but the fact that Scotland is so close to mainland Europe compared to the Canaries next to, to Morocco, um, it's given me a lot of chances to travel, really. Because traveling from the Canaries, inevitably you need to go to Madrid and then from Madrid you go somewhere else and it's just a pain in the ass, really, and it's expensive. Yeah. So it's, it's been great in that sense because it is honestly eye offering. So many places to go to. It's really like, I know it's not continental Europe, but it's very close to it. And it's great for, for traveling, you know, between the American continents and European continents and all that. It's great. It's great. So, yeah, like, I'm honestly so, so grateful in that sense. Like, so many opportunities. I, I couldn't even tell, man. Like, yeah, I've, thanks to, like, being here. I've, I, for example, I did, a, I did, like, a PGDE in Strathclyde Uni. Mm -hmm. which I ended up dropping just before I finished it. I didn't really like it. But thanks to that, I got a scholarship and I went to China and everything was paid for and things like that, you know, opportunities that you could only dream of in Gran Canaria, you know what I mean? Um, you'll be lucky to go to the next island for free, you know what I mean? <laughs> so imagine going to China. So things like that, is, it's just been absolutely fast and I'm loving it. Nice, nice. I, uh, I love the uh, weather as well. Yeah, I, I mean, what, if you look, if you get used to it, actually, it's not that bad. I know people are always, like, classically, there's always complaints, although it's raining all the time, but no, nah, it's all right. Like, depends I what you like. I don't burn here, so, you know, that's a plus. Ah, exactly. There you go. Um, I was actually curious, um, in photography, is there a, I mean, obviously, there's a cultural element in everything, but I'm curious, in photography, would you say that you've brought a certain cultural baggage, you know, the way you see things or is in the style? Is it more because you started photography here, it's more adapted to the local market? What? How? I mean, I'm just curious how that manifests, you know, like, let's say Spanish or Gran Canaria photography versus Scottish photography. Uh I think I'm heavily influenced by that mindset of classical music in the sense that I am extremely perfectionist. Whether I achieve it or not, it's a different thing, but I am extremely perfectionist with my photos. I normally spend maybe an hour and a half, two hours 
on just one photo when I'm going to post it. And it's something that I just cannot get rid of. And it's something that I learned in Gran Canaria mm -hmm. through the teachers I had, the violin teachers mainly. And it's, there's a lot of classical music in my photos. I know it sounds like it doesn't make any sense, but there's a lot of impost, um, discipline and structure inevitably as like whether i like it or i don't i don't i don't it's like it's again it's a different conversation but yeah it, it, there is so 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 much of that in my photos in the sense that like see if i go and take a photo like so say like i see like a, a, a composition that i like and i'm like okay i wanna i wanna try to take a photo of this and make it look nice i'll take about 50 photos of the same thing just in case and then once I'm at home, I'm like, no, I'm a, like the tree is like, you know, like 10 centimeters to the left here and things like that. Things are sickening really when you think about them. But yeah, I, honestly, I cannot help it. And I could not bring myself to just post a photo like that. And I'm like, ah, sorry, people will either like it or not. And then as I start working on it, I'm like, like personally, when it comes to, post-processing a photo or editing, like some people say. Uh, you don't hear the, same edit the term editing anymore because people think it's a bad thing. But yeah, editing, post-processing, right? When we do, when I do that, for me, cropping the image is like 80% of the job because it really establishes what the composition is going to be like. Yeah, because you set the frame, it. you set what they're going to be looking yeah. at and where, you know, yeah, absolutely. 100%. 100%. So maybe at the time of taking the photo, you just don't have the opportunity to frame it exactly as you want. And also maybe you're looking through the viewfinder, you know, it's not the same really. So when you see on a big screen, you're like, okay, I'm gonna crop it in a way that everything is aligned exactly as I want it to be. And then inevitably that will highlight elements of the photo. So for me, that is massive, 80% of post-processing a photo. And then, normally, I will try to, which is what most photographers do, is that I will try to make it look kind of similar to the way it was when you experienced it. But then, because my memory is shitty, I will maybe, like, inevitably, I will just transform it a bit and I will make it look slightly different. I don't know. The colors may be slightly more vibrant or... Like, I don't know, it might be slightly darker, slightly brighter. Uh, it's something that we all do, to be honest. Um, Even in our memories, but, if, if you're realistic. Exactly. We, we edit our exactly. memories as well, depending on what 100%. specifically we're looking at at the time. 100%. Exactly. So, yeah. Uh, I'm Like, when I'm working on a photo, like, I'm just looking at absolutely everything, and I'm like, no, what is this? What is that? Like, and then... It's almost like a conversation that I have with myself. Like, why did you do this here? Not in a bad way, just in a constructive way. Like, why did you take the photo like this? Or why did you add this in the photo? Like, and yeah, after like a, an hour long conversation with myself, you know, in my head and working on it, I'll be like, okay, I think I'm fairly satisfied because I'm never fully satisfied with the photos. Is the dark, is the, you know, the negative side of being so perfectionist. Yeah, well, I'll be like, okay, uh, I think this may be all right, and then I'll just you know post it, and then I love this. The good thing like, oh my is god, that it's I don't let... I... it's all right, it's all right. <laughs> I... Yeah, I think, yeah, I don't know. I, I... Yeah, so once once I'm like happy enough with the photo, I'll be like, okay, I'll put it out there, and then you know, hopefully, someone will enjoy it. That's the main go when it comes to social media really it's not so much about you know i want this to be fucking viral or whatever what i have learned actually is that and this is how sort of been leveling me mentally and keeping me sane was someone will guaranteed enjoy it you know because there's there's an yeah. you're not the only audience for anything it's very incredibly few things that you're the only audience for right chances are someone out there will would enjoy it but it's more about putting out the best version of your vision. So 
if whoever will enjoy it, they're getting the clearest, purest version of it, as opposed to some, you know, process that I'm gonna, I need to fit, and it has to be like this, and it has to be like that. If it's you, and if it's raw, and it's got the emotional content, it's got a message, whoever's gonna enjoy it, they're gonna get the biggest high out of it. Who's not gonna enjoy it? Not gonna enjoy it. That's just the way. It Simple as that. Yeah. <laughs> You've said it all. Like, you just need to you just need to aim for someone to enjoy it because ultimately that is the goal of art isn't it? and hopefully that will evoke something in someone and that person will be grateful for it mm -hmm. and i think something that keeps me going whenever i'm like not motivated with my photos is the fact that something someone might message me and go like oh you know i enjoyed this photo it was nice you inspired me to do this or that you know and it's always nice to hear it like it's it's it's, a, it's it's not even like besides the ego boost or anything like that it's just the fact that someone is appreciating or feeling something from something you've created and that is very satisfying it yeah, definitely that... it keeps me going yeah yeah i mean uh, i i'm i'm a bit uh, sensitive to this stuff because i grew up i, I grew up Jehovah's witness and there's a lot of things i can go into but i i on my brain, it was imprinted, you know, to do, to live a life of service for others, for others, for others, for others. And I have been learning that in some respects, that's unhealthy. There's certain things, a lot of things I actually have to do for yourself, yeah. you know, and for your own satisfaction and just for your own, well, yeah, satisfaction. And you have to be your own judge and arbiter of what you're doing and why you're doing it. So, yeah. um, that's why I'm like, I'm, I'm learning. I feel like I found the balance, but that balance between I'm doing this for you or I'm happy that you've enjoyed it. But at the end of the day, I'm happy with this work that I've created. I'm putting it out there to share it with you. So hopefully I can get paid money and create more stuff that I love creating. 100%, 100%. And that's when the job becomes, becomes enjoyable. And that's when you can call it a passion, when you are ultimately the first one to enjoy it. And yeah. then, you know, someone else is enjoying it, but you are satisfied with what you created. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing more rewarding than that. So far in any other job that I've had in my life, I've never found that satisfaction mm -hmm. because all the jobs I've had are, you know, service jobs to, you know, for someone else. And obviously I'm getting paid for it, but it, it, but it you just kills you inside, that. you know. It needs to feed you as well. It's not enough just to feed others. It has to give you something. And, you know, it's, uh, I, I, I say this for actors, you know, because in acting, he's like, oh, what, what's your goal with this piece? I want the audience to feel this. I want to help the audience. And I'm like, listen, if I wanted to help the audience, I would join the NHS. Like, exactly. Like, I respect the audience, but at the end of the day, I am doing this because this is why I love doing it. It feeds me and doing other stuff makes me feel miserable. So. And that's why you see many photographers out there that are just doing it for the people and they are just trying to please the audience. And and whenever you have a conversation with them, they're, they're the first ones to tell you that they're just so burnt out from it. And it's very, very, very easy to get sidetracked and do that. And it is the same in every form of art. You, you will have experienced the exact same thing. So, so many people burn out because th there's obviously the pressure of, of wanting exposure and wanting to make a living out of it. But, you know, it's, it's what makes creative jobs so, so bittersweet, I think. There, yeah. There's a lot of risks there, but the rewards are fucking amazing. Yeah. And yeah, like, it's, honestly, I've, I've never found this kind of satisfaction in any other job. Um, I've had many jobs here in Scotland and, um, they, you know they're all so fucking demotivating like you're just working for the man and yeah you get I paid mean, but you know i was this is leading me into um because we're gonna have to slowly wrap it up uh this yeah. leads me into my one of my favorite questions i like to ask towards the end which is my friend as a as a creative person you've done many crazy jobs to pay the bills what's one that stands out to you that was like what the fuck was that kfc springburn so I worked in KFC in Springburn right. um, a year after I moved to Scotland. Right. And my understanding of Scottish wasn't very good. So I used to talk like this, like an Spanish person, you know. Yeah. Um, like and I could, you the chicken. 
Yes, like my friends to the park, you know. So, you know, like I, I went to fucking KFC Springburn and, you know, that is not English. I'm sorry, but that's like. No, I like, don't no, like, no, no. Springburn yeah. is, you know, that is the most Scottish thing you'll probably hear. Like, as someone. KFC. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, that, that is the so, local uh, flavor of Scottish. So, my English was so shite, right, that to start with. When I went to do the interview, which wasn't there, it was in Glasgow in the city centre in the Four Corners. I went to the interview, it was like, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 people in the room and we had to introduce ourselves. So uh, I was so fucking nervous, right? This is like me applying for KFC. So, I, oh my God, I was just dying inside, right? And I had to, I had to speak. So I said, so my name's Eduardo and I just, I, I cannot wait to work for McDonald's. And I said that in fucking KFC. <laughs> like, we from Petitor number fucking one. I mean, I was like, right, that's me. The manager's like, root? Like, if you want to fucking go for McDonald's, you don't need to rub it in our face, bro. Like, I was just like, this is, this is straight, my man. That's me. That's me, done. <laughs> and in, somehow I kept the job. But after that, because my English wasn't that good, especially, like, with a Scottish accent, they put me in the middle house, so I was between the kitchen and, you know, like, the public facing uh-huh. yeah. um, duty. So I was basically, a, like, the burger boy, right? Just assembling the burgers and all that. And there was one day that I went to the bench shed, and I was just going to take the, the bench out. And there was this woman just queuing around the bench shed to, to go to the, the drive through bit. And, you know, classic, like, rude and, you know, classic KFC customer, really. And she just opened the window and I went like that. Right, come here, I've got an order for you. And I'm like, like, do you not see me that I'm literally holding a fucking rubbish mat? Yeah. And I'm like, I was, I was a bit... They have that thing where they're like, you got two plates in your hand and someone's like, excuse me. And you're like, bro, right, come on. There's something about being a customer that we all do. That's very irritating. We it's true, such it's true. a rude person. I put my we all do it. We all do it. I think once you've worked in these kind of jobs, you do change your approach and you try your best. But we've all been frustrated as customers and we've all been like that. But anyway, she was just playing rude, right? She had no excuse. So she was just like, come here. I've got an order for you. I'm like, no, no, you need to go to the window. And she just went, oh, fuck off, you fucking ginger prat. And I was like, okay, something clicked in my brain. And I was like, I am in Scotland and I must learn the language of these people. And from that day, I tried my very best <laughs> to fit in somehow. And because the way I was speaking to her was very like Spanish like, and I think she could pick up that. And you know, when people sense an accent, they use that against you. They almost see that as like something that, that makes you, you know, if they want to the antagonize you, yeah. they try to bully you for it. Yeah. People will pick up an accent. People love doing that, right? Because they feel a lot of power in that. Because they don't have that issue, like a, a native speaker. So the moment she said that, I just started laughing and I just went, right, I need to learn this fucking accent, man, because this is fucking annoying me. <laughs> like even my manager, she was trying so hard to be polite and and, and corporate about you know, anything that she had to tell me and I just could not understand her in the slightest, like... And let's can, be I, can I get a hat? Yeah. Say again, sir? And let's be honest, part of it is was because you wanted to tell this woman what, exactly what you thought of her in that moment, but you needed the right words. Yes, I had it in Spanish, but sadly <laughs> that wouldn't have, you know, been understood the same way. Um yeah like it honestly it, it annoyed me so much but also i found it so funny that I, I thought you know what i'm gonna try find the positive in this kind of experience and, and i'm gonna try and improve my right. my understanding i got one more question we're gonna yeah. have to take a break because i don't think the time is gonna be That's enough. Fine. i don't want to rush absolutely fine so quick break and we'll be back for one more question sounds good see you soon cheers dude here we are again hello hello uh, so the final question I love to ask people is food related, my friend, which is what food from Gran Canaria or whatever you love or miss should people in the UK know about? Okay, so we have a thing called, uh, 
We have a thing called papas con mojo. So papas is just potatoes. And mojo is like a garlicky sauce that um, it's very hard to explain. So it's spelled like M-O-J-O, like mojo, kind of mojo. And we have two types of sauce. It's, a, it's such a simple dish, right? It's just potatoes and a sauce. But no, like it's so effective. Grilled, fried, what, what kind of boiled? So it's like it's kind of like baby potatoes, so quite small in size. And we basically like cook them covered in ridiculous amount of salt, which leads, you know, like it basically makes the skin like wrinkle, kind of. Yeah. In fact, we call them papas. Yeah, we call them papa harugada, and that means wrinkled potatoes because that's what happens on the skin with all the salt. So it's kind of like boiled potatoes, basically. It's, kind, it's the same effect. Um, so it's such a simple dish, right? But so effective. And like the amount of garlic that goes in the, in the sauce is just, it's, it should be illegal, basically. But somehow us Canadians... We always go for that when it comes to like on a on a first date. So you know, it's the absolute worst choice ever when <laughs> when you want to like you know win right. someone after the day. Or it's um, genius because you both smell like garlic. Exactly. So you're Whatever both. Whatever like, else was going you know, on, the garlic over. I, I, you are as as low as each other now, so it's fine. You know, we're on the same level here. You know, so <laughs> it's quite funny the way we always do that. Um, but that is it's, so, it's so good, man. Like it, it's so good. There's this shop in in Great Western Road in Glasgow. Um, people who live in Glasgow might know the shop, and it's like it's got like Hispanic products. So anything ranging ranging from um, Spain, Canary Islands, Latin America, um, and it's quite good. It's quite good, and they do sell mojo there. So. Yeah, I've tried that a few times, the one that they sell, and it's quite good. Hang on, so it's People should really it. try it. Right? I yes. will probably try Aye. it. Let's come on. You should. Uh, okay. okay. You can enjoy it. The garlic sauce. It's what, what are we talking about? What kind of garlic sauce is it? It's garlic with cream, garlic with yogurt, <laughs> yeah. garlic so, with... It, it's got a lot of oil, and there's two types, so mojo verde and mojo rojo, so red and green. Okay. Um, now this is when white different story. I so this is when I prove that I am the worst cook in the world, right? Because I don't even know the ingredients, but I think the green one has like parsley, and the red one has paprika. <laughs> I don't know, man. Entry. Oh my god, I'm the worst cook in the world. Um, I despise cooking. By the way, it's like the worst. I prefer to clean. Um, but I love to eat. And that's definitely something that people should try because it's so good, man. Mm. So, so good. So good. So garlicky. That's amazing. And this it is now... Fails. I'm, I mean, I'm gonna... I, I'm not gonna lie. So my go-to garlic thing now is I literally chop up garlic, a little bit of salt, a little bit of olive oil, and I just... And some oregano, and I mix it together nice. with yogurt. And that's my homemade garlic yogurt, and I don't care. But it's literally half a garlic. Sometimes even the whole thing. Just... Amazing. That's the way it should be, to be honest. Yeah. The way yeah. it should be. Amazing. Honestly, okay. anything with garlic is just instantly instantly better, I think. And now, and now I've got a random question because you okay. said papas and I used to work in a Moroccan place and they had uh, batatas haras. And... Batata is sweet potato. Okay, right. Because I was going to ask, is there a difference? Between... I was going to ask, what's the difference between Spanish... Uh, mainland Spa Spanish and then Gran Canaria Spanish? So, mainland Spaniards will say patata with a P, right? Yeah. But uh, batata with a B is sweet potato. Right. I think that's the word you said there. And then anywhere else, Canary Islands and Latin America, we say papa. Papa. The P -A -P -A. Okay. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, we have quite a different language for many things. Um, yeah, you would be. It's an island. It's uh, you know, it's isolated. It's fairly distant as well. And we have a lot of immigration with Venezuela, Cuba, Colombia. So our words and our accent. Our accent is basically Latin American, even though we are Spanish. Um, so culturally speaking, we are very different from mainland Spain. You know, apart from all this stuff that you would get on the telly and things that are more like 
Yeah, because that's just general, satellite. That's just the telly, right? right? Uh-huh. Yeah. But we are fairly different, to be fair. Uh-huh. Maybe like you know, yeah, yeah, like yeah. We, honestly, like here in Glasgow, especially, like I have many more things in common with someone. Like one of my best pals, Juliana, she's Colombian, and we have such so much more in common with many people from mainland Spain. You know, um, huh. even though Spain is my country at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. Well, that's that's gonna be a topic for a different interview, my friend, because this is yeah. Cool. Thank Definitely. you so much. Yeah, yeah. No worries. Thank you for thank you for letting me join.